Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Kevin Tomlinson. Hi Kevin. Hi Joanna, how are you? I'm good. Great <laughs> to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Kevin is a speculative fiction author, blogger and host of several podcasts including The Wordslingers, Creative Writing Career and Self-Publishing Answers and we were, we're going to come back to that in a minute <laughs> but um, just start by telling us a bit more about you and your writing background. Well, uh, I've actually been writing professionally uh, since I was 12 years old, which is a fancy way of saying I got paid to write, but it doesn't mean I made a living doing wow. it. What did <laughs> but, you get paid uh, to write at 12 years old? I was writing, an, a seri I was writing sort of an editorial for um, uh, our local paper, sort of a teen beat kind of thing. Uh, so I went and covered events and I, you know, talked to other teens in the area and got their opinions on things. So, yeah, cool. it didn't pay much. It was like $10 a column, but I, you know, that was my first step into being paid as a writer. So I count it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and from then? <laughs> from then, the highlights. Um, you know, and I went, I went from uh, doing that sort of thing all through school, all through high school and everything. Um, and in college, I got involved in the newspaper, you know, arena there. Uh, started writing fiction. Well, I've, been, I've written fiction my whole life, really. Uh, I always tell it, the joke is I wrote my first book when I was five years old. That's why I tell everybody. And it was five pages of notebook paper, front and back. And I uh, hand drew a cover and everything. So I was uh, my own cover designer even back then. But uh, fiction was kind of that thing that I always loved the most. And I started writing short stories, trying to market those and sell those. Didn't really have a lot of success. I hit a few magazines and uh, got a few things published. And that was encouraging, but it wasn't all that lucrative. So I drifted into copywriting <laughs> as a career for a while. Because right. so, you can make money as a copywriter. A lot of people don't want to pay you to just sit around and write fiction, I guess. Yeah, so that's interesting. So copywriting has been your main paid job? Yeah, for yeah. a long time. I'm, I'm finally getting to a point where I'm, I'm starting to retire from that. I, my, co my client list has been called down quite a bit. And uh, you know, those who do hire me, you know, they expect to pay a little more if they want me to write. And so it's, it's getting a little, a little better. I'm, I'm working on uh, kind of closing that door, maybe just taking on the rare occasional client every now and then. But uh, I'm, I'm mostly really happy to move away from copywriting as a career. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Well, I'm interested. I mean, because, uh, of course, like, Sean Platt is to me the guy who moved, you know, yeah. the big guy who moved from copywriting. And, right. uh, and Johnny B. Turin, of course. And um, do you ha what kind of and if people don't know, you know, copywriting is the more business writing where people right. take action and you can often write quite boring stuff, I guess. Right. But right. Um, but there are a lot of skills that can transfer, I guess. But is it hard to change your mindset between the copywriting guy and the fiction guy you know it really wasn't um i i spent a lot of time or, or, so a lot of copywriting i do is pretty boring i mean i or did was pretty boring I, I wrote like annual reports and white papers and that sort of thing and actually um i became kind of known as that guy you go to when you want something that has a little you know a little bit of zip to it instead of just this straight, boring, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wrote annual reports for companies uh, and contributed to a few annual reports to some big name companies that uh, had a little bit of flair to them. So at least I got to be creative in that way. Um, but I think there's a lot of room. I, you know, most of the copywriting I did was for marketing and advertising. So I, I got to be pretty creative. A lot of it was B2B. And so you have to be careful about how you're creative. <laughs> but yeah. switching mindsets was never really a problem for me. The skills that transfer really, uh, just the discipline of sitting down each day and hitting a deadline is the biggest skill. Mm. Um, and also, you know, I, I, I do credit my copywriting career with improving my, the general quality of my writing because it's, you know, everyone thinks they're a good writer until they get notes back from editors and publishers and that sort of thing. And no one's a bigger critic than the person who paid you to write. So <laughs> you learn a lot. Yeah, exactly. And of course, it helps with writing um, sales descriptions and right. uh, advertising, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, I find that one of the things that a lot of people struggle, a lot of authors, indie authors in particular struggle with is like writing their pitch or, or their, some people call it their blurb or their, 
back cover matter or whatever they call it. But I mean, a lot of people struggle with that kind of thing or they struggle with writing an ad or, you know, uh, just a basic description of their book. And I don't really have that struggle because I've done that for other people for so long. So mm. I'm not saying they're perfect. Uh, they need improvement. And every now and then I go back and look and say and cringe and say, well, I could do that better. Uh, but at least I know, I mean, I can look at that and say, this is where it's weak. This is where it's strong. This is where I was just being lazy and trying to get it, you know, published <laughs> right away. Yeah, well, and, you know, that's definitely something on my list for next year because we can, we always go back over the books, don't we, that we've done in the yeah. past. But what we're talking about today and, you know, we're, one of the critical aspects about actually making a living uh, as a writer or with books in particular as opposed to copywriting is deciding what you're going to give up in right. order to achieve the things you want to achieve. Um, and back in 2011, I did a massive um, downsize and shift from a four bedroom house to a one bedroom flat and right. you know changed a lot of stuff. And now you're going through something yes. right now, aren't you? So I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, tell us about these big changes that you're making and why. Well, the first thing I wanna point out is the parallel there because we literally in November, which at the time of uh, you and I chatting, it's this, it's mid December. Uh, in November, towards the end of November, we sold our four bedroom house and we crammed everything into a one bedroom apartment. Uh, <laughs> that's that's like the interim step. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're actually we're moving into a sort of RV lifestyle. Uh, it's something my wife and I have talked about for years, and in the past couple of years in particular, we've become very interested in it. And that's required us to start thinking in terms of. You know, what do we have that's weighing us down, that takes up more space than it should? And, and, you know, what do we need to get rid of in order to fit? Because I don't know if you've looked at RVs lately, but they're not, you know, McMansions on wheels typically. I mean, <laughs> you're not going to be able to cram four bedrooms in there. Mm. So we we're having to make some tough decisions. This this apartment is kind of one part of, I, as we said before the call, I'm, we're kind of in phase one where we've already gotten rid of a lot of our stuff. We've already started thinking in terms of how do we, you know, do the things we do with less, you know, uh, fewer resources, I guess. And uh, the apartment was kind of that interim step between the house and jumping directly into an RV. So we're buying actually a camper uh, this weekend, actually. <laughs> We've already picked it out. We've already put down deposits. And uh, it's a small camper. It's not the one we'll live in full time. But it's that kind of, you know, it's the runabout in terms of Star Trek. Like it's the one that we're taking away from the, the uh, mothership for a while uh, and branching out. And then mm. we move on from there. It's, it's been ad adventurous, we'll say. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's get into that in more detail. So why did you decide to do this? So uh, a big part of it is literally every time we've, we've traveled to uh, – made a big deal of travel, I guess. Uh, we've gone overseas together. We've traveled to various places in the U.S. Um, I've literally sat down and written a book while we were there. I mean, it's it's kind of uncanny. And it's not that I don't write books while at home. It's just that the, the stuff I'm churning out when we're out and traveling has this flavor to it that is just remarkable. And so it really was a de the decision kind of came around as uh, in part because it adds flavor to my work. It adds a, a whole new dimension to the work. Mm. But we also, we're very sedentary. Um, I, I sit in front of a computer all day long. So does my wife. Uh, and we, we kind of every now and then look up and notice that the, the tent of the sky has changed or something, you know, and we just want to, put ourselves in a position where it's far more likely that we're going to get out and live and experience things uh, than we are going to watch them on TV or something, you know? So <laughs> that was a big motivator, actually. That is so funny because on my wall, I have, I have a lot of things on my wall. So I say this quite a lot on the show and there's always something new. But <laughs> You I have to have... turn the camera. You got to show me. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I will. <laughs> um, but this, this, this thing says, right to live, what is living today? Yeah. And that exactly travels the same for me. I have to travel all yeah. the, you know, not all the time. I get itchy foot syndrome, my husband calls it. And, yeah. and being away, that just adds, well, it's all my writing comes from from travel, actually. Right. So I really, I really get that. And that living more is so important because we can get so obsessed with, you oh, know, yeah. whatever the next. And it, it will never stop, will it, as writers? This won't stop until like the day we die. Uh, no. And in fact, um, 
something interesting happened recently because I pinged my mailing list uh, to, to just sort of ask, like, what would you like to see next? Because there are passion projects I want to pursue. Mm. And one of those was I, I want to start writing more narrative nonfiction. Um, and my list liked that idea, but they overwhelmingly they, they asked for a sequel to Evergreen, yeah. which is fine. Um, <laughs> and the Evergreen is definitely my favorite book uh, of, of whatever I've written. Uh, but – you know, the narrative nonfiction has a place in my heart because I love authors like uh, Malcolm Gladwell and, uh, you know, Bill Bryson and, you know, mm. Elizabeth Gilbert. I love I love those writers and I love what they do. Uh, and I wanted to do something in that vein. But I, I have literally sat down a hundred times to start something I thought was going to be that book. And uh, ultimately, I realized I hit bottom very quickly. Mm. And it's not because I don't have the experiences already it's it's more that i don't have anything there's no passion behind it because i'm i'm too distanced from those experiences and i i feel like getting out and experiencing more of the world around us as we travel will energize me and and push me to write that kind of thing like i'll i'll be impassioned i can draw on my past experiences mm. using the energy of the present moment that's kind of the idea mm. Oh, no, I think I think that'd be great. I think it's a, a brilliant idea. But of course, everyone's now going, what about your wife? <laughs> so what, what, what does your wife do? And, um, you know, how did that conversation go? Because I, I mean, my husband also obviously downsized with me. And it's, uh, I get emails from people who say, this is a difficult conversation to have. So, so how right. did you do that? And, and how's how's she she adapting? Here's where I'm phenomenally lucky. Because, well, actually, it's interesting, because um, I I've pitched this idea over the years. The first time I ever mentioned living in an RV was shortly after we got married. And my wife's exact words were, wow, that's really attractive. And uh, <laughs> so she wasn't on board with that uh, for a long time. But it just seems that at, you know, the longer we know each other, the more in tune we kind of get with this idea. She loves to travel too. She grew up overseas. She was an expat. Um, you know, She was used to living in places like um, uh, Singapore and you know, areas like that. So she kind of misses that too. Uh, so it wasn't tough to talk her into it, but you know, as far as her work and that sort of thing, we're we're still figuring out what she's going to do when we're on the road because we feel like we'll probably be able to support support ourselves just fine from you know from my income. Um, I don't think that's going to be an issue. It's just that no one wants to be the tag along. And where she's coming in on this is she is a big fan of history. And so we're looking at ways that she can use that passion uh, while we're moving around. And, mm -hmm. you know, she's a project manager by trade right now. Uh, there are opportunities for her to continue working um, on the go. That we're looking into some of that. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't tough. Actually, she's kind of talked me into it more than anything recently because I, I kind of got to a point where I was uh, more or less uh, – I was sort of resigned to uh, this is where we live and we'll just travel every now and then. Mm. I had kind of given up on that. But she, she got on fire for this uh, about uh, nearly a year ago now. And uh, it's led to us selling our home and, you know, we're buying a camper and we're, you know, <laughs> we're, we've we're taken steps. Yeah, yeah, it's moving quick now. Which I think is really interesting. Um, uh, just on the history, do you know um, uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. and for the listeners, I've, my husband loves it. It's, it's sort of four hours long, eight hours long, some of these <laughs> right, shows. They're right. absolutely amazing. But, right. but that what's so f interesting now is you can say something like, oh, my wife's interested in history. And I immediately think of someone who's making a full-time living out yeah. of history and, well, and that's right and, yeah. and you can make a full-time living from an rv and i can make one you know from my laptop wherever i right. am as well and right. this is what's so exciting about the world we live in um but i i wanted to ask you some more about the downsizing so um i mean i found it incredibly liberating and i don't get very attached to things in general right. like i don't like things i like experiences i don't right. really like presents um i love um one of the big things we did I guess was we got rid of nearly two and a half thousand print books and moved, yes. moved to digital so what are some of the big <laughs> the big shifts in terms of stuff and, and okay. what, what has surprised you that uh we did that uh mm -hmm. and that you made me cry have to, yeah. you have to yeah <laughs> I mean I I and uh it, you know and getting rid of and I was not I was in no way prepared for the emotional impact of seeing these books go mm -hmm. um 
you know, I don't know if they have this in, in the UK. Uh, we have half price books in my area. It's a, mm-hmm. uh, it's a bookstore that will buy back your books at a discounted price. And, uh, I shop there all the time, but you know, taking my, taking my little babies in and handing them these boxes of books and, you know, having to do it. And it, what was worse was it was exhausting to carry everything in, mm-hmm. hurt me physically to carry everything in. And then I had to sit and watch them go th- paw through my books, you know. And, and so throw that's, some aside because they're not worth anything. Yeah, they're like, yeah, this, and you, know, you just know that's going in the dumpster, you know. Like, no. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that, that was a challenge. Uh, design, the thing, things that kind of hit us, uh, nostalgia has been our biggest enemy in this, mm-hmm. actually. Uh, it's tough to overcome. We had three separate garage sales and made quite a bit of money. We sold quite a few things. And really, when we had the house all staged and, and people were coming through and looking, and we thought, we're ready. This stuff, this is nothing, you know. And this is, you know, a few rooms worth of stuff, and we can c- compact this down to a, a storage unit. Uh, but it turned out it was, you know, a lot more than we thought. And where we thought we had really culled down our, you know, sort of physical footprint, you know, we're still pretty big, which is why we ch- we changed the plan slightly. Because originally it was sell the house, walk into an RV, start driving. And we realized pretty quickly we, could, we couldn't do that. Um, so now we have... We have a storage unit. We are we have this apartment. This apartment contains a lot of items all on its own. But we're spending some time. We've signed a year lease, so we're mm-hmm. spending the next year going through the things that we have, selling things, giving things to family, and that's what it all comes down to. Is there's you got to make that emotional separation. Mm-hmm. And what we're finding is I get rid of something I've held on to books, uh, a piece of furniture. You know, and it's ridiculous what we hold on to. My wife is holding on to her grandmother's bed. Not the cool headboard, like sleigh bed frame or any of that, but a box spring and a, you know, <laughs> a, a mattress. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Like stuff you can buy at any given Walmart she's holding on to out of nostalgia. Um, but that's the, the trick there is to make that emotional separation. And then suddenly you discover you've tapped into this whole new well of energy. Like it's mm-hmm. just... It's it's almost like magic. Like suddenly I, I get rid of this, you know, armoire or something that I have no real emotional attachment to. It was just handed to me by a family member, you know. And I uh, I ask around and no one wants it. And I start to realize I'm paying money to hold on to something that no one else in my family wanted, <laughs> and I feel bad about giving it away. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those are those are the things that are very challenging. I mean, the real challenges are you know. To yet to come, I believe, because we've there's things there are things we're figuring out, and I've got some tips for people if you're interested. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're learning a lot about you know how we're going to manage our actual lives while we're on the road. But getting downsizing has been challenging, um, and it, it continues to be a challenge. And I I guess my advice is, you know, uh, <laughs> you have to you're going to have to ask yourself some hard questions about what's the what is the purpose of this thing mm-hmm. and. Am I using it for that purpose or am I just holding on to it? And, um, you know, I, I grew up in a household that grew up in the, that came through the depression. So, uh, you know, it was always save everything. My grandfather had a, a rubber band ball the size of my head that, you know, none of the rubber bands were any good anymore, but we, you know, we have this giant rubber band ball. So yeah, it's, it's, those emotional attachments will kill you. <laughs> yeah, and and I know some people are thinking, but I like my emotional attachments. Yes. And, and we're, of course, not saying that everyone should do this type of no. life. But I found, I, the, and I guess going back to the reason why, in order to make a full-time living with books, it's better mm-hmm. to define your full-time living as less than it right. would be if you have a four-bedroom house yeah. and a mortgage. And we had two cars and we had an investment property. And we, you know, we had, there were so many things that were stopping me from doing this full-time. And they were all financial ties that then you build up a life to fit into what you're expected to be. So, right, you know, right. and you once you own a four bedroom house, you have to fill it with stuff. Whereas right. now you've got a one bedroom flat, you know, you, right. you, you have to say no to how much stuff. Now, that emotional attachment over time is really interesting because what we ended up doing was we got rid of the house. We put everything in storage uh, and left for a year. 
so we actually came back to England at the time and our storage unit was in Australia. Right. By the time we went back a year later, we were like, what the hell? Why did we keep this? Yeah. You know, yeah. and you realize that you just need that bit of distance. So, so the stuff you put in that storage unit, even when you right. get the RV, eventually you'll go back to it and just be over it so oh, I, yeah, I agree with you it takes <laughs> it takes like a number of steps to get that and of course I still have a couple of boxes here in my room of stuff I will never get rid of but it literally is a couple of boxes as opposed yeah. to and all my diaries which are behind me I do have yes increasingly more diaries well, it, and it, I think it's kind of yeah I, and I do too I mean yeah. and that's the They're that's heavy. the cost of being a writer and they are heavy I've been and I try as I might I'm only just now starting to journal on um, an app rather yeah, than see, I a won't book. do that I just won't I know do it's, that because it doesn't feel technology. right <laughs> it will fail at some point <laughs> I still have my moleskins I still yeah, have yeah, you know a collection of those so I'll always have that because uh, I, I have a love affair with ink and paper mm. um mm. But yes, there are going to be things that you will want. You, you not only will want to hold on, you should hold on to. Absolutely. You definitely shouldn't get rid of journals, and you definitely shouldn't get rid of, you know, some something priceless that reminds you of someone you love. Mm. Um, but not and a I, bed. I agree with. But the not bed. a bed. No. <laughs> no. A I mean, a, you know, if there were a comforter or something, you know, I, I don't. Even if that, even if it was some bargain basement, you know, garage sale purchase that her, her grandmother had made fine I, w I could live with certain things but a, a box spring I mean <laughs> yeah. but yeah. uh yeah that's <laughs> that's good but um you mentioned some of the, the ways that you're going to change uh you know uh things and the way you're going to work so tell us some right. of those uh things you've been thinking so uh, some of the problems you come across when you're thinking about going completely mobile are, you know, you always get asked questions like, how are you going to get your mail and how are you going to get prescription drugs and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, we have to deal with those. Uh, my wife has a couple of prescriptions we have to keep up with. But there are a lot of services out there. And, uh, for example, we're, we're – we're not yet. We're we're courting them. Uh, we're about we're about to become members of a group called um, Escapees RV Club, which I don't know if they're uh, international or not, but I love the name. Mm. Uh, and, but they are. Uh, they have a lot of benefits uh, for members. Things like you know you can use them as a permanent mailing address. Um, mm. They have a job center. So if you are an author, for example, uh, and you're not quite making a living at it, or your spouse wants to do some work. Uh, you can find jobs through their job board, which are typically, you know, they can be full time or they can be part time or seasonal or whatever. There's a lot out there. Uh, another group that does that is Work Camper, and that's uh, W O R W O R K A M P E R, and they are a um, that's kind of a movement more than anything. But Work Camper News is all about uh, connecting you with possible job opportunities, like mm. jobs you can do in exchange for you know, RV lots, things like that. But these, you know, you have um, uh, a lot of services out there like this and they'll, they'll do things like scan your mail for you or, uh, you know, forward your prescription drugs to wherever you happen to be, that sort of thing. And so there's a lot of that stuff we're discovering. And I'll be honest, that's kind of the fun of this is hey, I'm going through and discovering all these like apps and websites and clubs and things and you know the cost of these things is really fairly low mm -hmm. uh when you start thinking about you know what you're getting out of it mm -hmm. uh it's almost like having a va to go through your mail i mean come on that's just cool you know <laughs> that is good. and of course you just increasingly go more and more digital <clears throat> you know that's right. just just the benefit of it as right. well is you just you you scan everything and you have you know everything's on Dropbox or whatever and right yeah I mean I think that's true whether you're going to move into an RV or if you're just kind of decluttering and I guess right. um I think the, well this will be going out to what you know end of December beginning of January 2016 and you know even if people don't want to move into an RV like now's a really good time to be looking at like what's really important isn't right it? and yeah and that's kind of what you you're doing is you're examining what's important in in your life and in in the end i think that's really it it just sort of comes down to that as the point um we we tend to hold on to things or just humans in general we tend to hold on to things and things we don't necessarily need i used to have a huge dvd collection you know thousands of them and i stream at one point, my wife and I realized that we hadn't watched a DVD 
in, Mm -hmm. you know, almost the entire 10 years we've been married. And, um, you know, books, I owned hundreds, maybe thousands of books. And most of the ones that I love and reread, I have on my Kindle. So I can do that. But so there is that sort of reducing, uh, what's the term? I read a book recently called Abundance. The future is yeah. better oh, than that is that is one of my favorite books. Absolutely right. Peter, and Peter the, Diamandis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the um, one of the principles he talked about was uh, miniaturization. Yeah. Which is that that idea of you know I don't need a bookshelf full of books. I've got a device. Actually, I just read off my iPhone. Uh, I have a six plus, so it's a big screen. I, my wife reads off of her um, iPad. I don't need a, a bookshelf cram full of books. I might have it because I enjoy that. There's always that tactile experience. I'm getting more comfortable, by the way, with buying a, a, a physical book and reading it and then giving it away um, or selling it sometimes. But I, I prefer to give them away. I want to give that book to somebody who's going to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So I'm becoming more comfortable with that. And through that act, by the way, um, there's a sort of – there's something that happens to your soul. I mean, there's just this – you know, you, you get a little more free, but you also, you, you get a little stronger. Uh, you realize that all this stuff is not what defines you. And I think that's why we hold on to things. Because we have this erroneous uh, conception that that these things define us. I know I do. I mean, I hold on to stuff. I constantly find myself, you know, regretting little things that I lost or gave away or stolen or whatever. And I I kick myself over that and and there's no reason to. That mm. that wasn't a part of me. It was just part of my story for a time and now it's gone. Yeah, and I actually really love print on demand and I wish yeah. all authors had print on demand because yeah. sometimes I want to give a book to people and as a gift or whatever and I go to order it and they don't and it's and it's and literally out of print. Now, who would have thought in the days of print on demand <laughs> that any book would be out of print? And yeah. uh, you know, it's kind of like it's crazy, but what I love about our books you know you and i as indies if we need our books at any point in your journey you just order it online and and it will be delivered so (laughs) that's the thing it's really not a big deal but i wanted to ask you um uh just one more thing on the on the downsizing and the changing things is that is Mm -hmm. the uh, the fear aspect. So, yes. Um, what are the fears that you've had, and how are you tackling those? So you know, there's always the big ones. the biggest is always income. You know, like, am I, is my income stable? Am I going to have money? Am I going to find myself, you know, uh, broke and, and living on the streets? And of course I won't because I'll have an RV. So, uh, <laughs> but, just be uh, parked up somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, you know, that's a, that's a fear. Is, and the, the other fear is that, you know, we'll, we'll get out in the wilderness somewhere and something will happen and, you know, we don't have a, a way to find help or, you know, there's, you know, we're distanced from family and something happens to family. There's all those fears. Uh, the, the trouble with that thinking though is, you know, that stuff could happen anyway. I mean, if I take a trip to Europe, um, next month, just for the heck of it, uh, I could get a phone call, you know, in midair, something bad could happen. Um, and you know, the, those things that just happens, that's just life. That's what life is. Uh, and the way we're mitigating fears about like our finances, I mean, we've we've sold some properties. Um, we have some assets that we're kind of liquidating, and that's becoming sort of a backup fund. Uh, you know, we're paying down any debts we have. That that helps. You know, our monthly overhead is is being dramatically reduced mm-hmm. as a part of this, which was uh, very important to us. And then, um, you know, I have uh, I have the writing as a stream of income. I have. Uh, little trickles from other ventures that I'm involved in that that help uh, with income, and it's not like I'm going to cease to to do entrepreneurial things <laughs> when I, when I step out of this apartment. I mean, we're constantly looking at ways that we can kind of boost that income stream. So those that's the biggest fear. Another fear, is, of course, you know, will we be at each other's throats or you know something along those lines? And and I've talked to a number of people. Um, who have done this, who have uh, uh, stepped out and gone into a full-time RV lifestyle. And overwhelmingly, the response I get from those people is that far from putting each other at, you know, at each other's throats, they actually get along much better. They they learn to adapt to each other. It's a little bit like, um, I'm sure you've read 4-Hour Workweek. Mm. And there's a there's a, a bit in there where he talks about uh, this woman who travels with her kids and 
they were always bickering and fighting, but suddenly they're on a sailboat and they got nothing to do but get along. So it's kind of that idea. I think that you grow closer. Uh, there's a, there are these little fears, but as we come up with a fear, um, my response is generally go find the solution and mm. figure out how you deal with that. And, you know, I have a pacemaker um, because of a birth, a heart, a birth defect in my heart. I have a pacemaker. Uh, I had to answer questions like, you know, what do I do when I need checkups for that? You know, what I need, <laughs> what happens if something goes wrong with it? And uh, I don't have my cardiologist down the street, you know? So those questions are, uh, they need to be answered, but they don't have to dictate what you do next. They, mm. Or if they dictate what you do next, they don't have to stop you from doing the thing that you're trying to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the eliminating debt because we did, you know, we eliminated our debt by changing right. the structure. I mean, as soon as you stru- restructure anything, so if people listening are like, yeah, but I'm not going to do that. If you look at what you want to achieve and then yeah. you restructure things, even if it's, it doesn't have to be your full time income, you know, right. l- like, you know, like, like we do, it, it could be a percentage. And just by changing your mindset I seriously I remember the day when I kind of realized that the only thing stopping me was my own the the way that I had created my life and right. had built up all these expectations and if yeah. I just changed my own expectations of what was important and what life I could live then everything would be different right. and it, it was just an amazing kind of turnaround um and <laughs> that that day changed my life um what well, no, we you know yeah, what we keep finding is uh, we, ca- we keep sort of panicking over things. Um, you, you get into this tendency of thinking the life you have right now and the way your life works right now is exactly how it has to continue. Yeah. <laughs> so we start thinking of things like, you know, and I'm, I'm struggling to, k- to come up with a really good example, but I mean, you think about how you make dinner, for mm, example. Yeah. And we have lots of kitchen gadgets we have lots of pots and pans but we're not going to have room for all that in the rv what do we do how do we eat we're going to starve death (laughs) and the reality of it is i mean most all right for example we have an outdoor kitchen for the rv the world becomes our kitchen at that Mm. point i've got you know i don't need every kitchen gadget that i have in order to prepare a meal so you you figure it out you figure out how to we're uh in the process now of downsizing the amount of kitchen gadgets we actually have to like here are three gadgets that do the job of these 25 gadgets yeah so you start thinking a little differently i love this whole tiny house movement oh, i idea. love the tiny house thing too. it's very american <laughs> we don't really have it so much in europe but i really? love i love the tiny house porn you know all the little pictures yes. i'm not yes. you know they're, they're so cute <laughs> <laughs> yes because it's and I, I don't know what it is about that that appeals mm. to uh to me in particular or anyone in general but there is something to be said for reducing your footprint and not in the the, the sort of hippie way, <laughs> you know, not in the, not in the green, um, sense, although that has, there is an impact is there, but, and that's wonderful and don't get me wrong, but, uh, what it does for you personally, I mean, first of all, there's less for you to worry about. I don't have to worry about, you know, what happens if there's a fire and all these things are destroyed. I mean, if if that did happen, I would just start over exactly the way we're doing. Just walk you out know? your tiny door. <laughs> exactly. So, and how much space do you really need? I mean, I, you know, one thing I miss is um, my sound booth in in my little studio from my home. Uh, yeah. uh, I honestly thought I was going to uh, uh, really regret that. Um, and when I start, you know, I do these podcasts. Uh, I have to have quiet. I have to have, you know. A uh, certain uh, level of quality, and uh, what I discovered was I actually had alternate equipment that I could set up very easily. You're you're seeing one of those pieces right now in this video, but um, I have this whole miniaturized setup that replicates what I was doing in my big studio setting, mm. and I love that. I mm. love rethinking, <laughs> and I, I think that's important. You know, as an author, you know, to be able to take those those disparate ideas and pieces and and rethink them and put them back together again uh Mm -hmm. that's really what we're doing we're writing the story of our lives by rethinking what we have. You what know? we have. And, and I do, I mean, the biggest thing for me is the internet. I mean, you, yes. basically, if you've got a, a laptop, a phone, internet yes. access, your world is actually huge. I yes. mean, you actually have, you, the expanse is in your mind and it's 
and it's yes. on the internet. So that's I that miniaturization. Think, yeah. yeah, that's kind of the difference, isn't it? And you can have your social life. You can have, you know, th there are lots of things you can do through through the internet. So that's very very cool. Um, so I just want before we finish up because we you and I could clearly talk about this uh, clearly. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, but I wanted just to just tell us um, about the podcasts you have and okay. why do you have so many podcasts? <laughs> um, I started with Wordslinger podcast, and I literally started that so that I'd have an opportunity to talk to people like you uh, and and a few others, Jonathan Mayberry, uh, who you mentioned you really like. Um, and the reason was I I needed an excuse to be able to ask these people the questions that were most pressing for me. And I thought, you know, well, I could I should be generous with this information and share it. So that was podcast number one. Uh, and then I actually. Um, at a time where I was considering adding coaching to my business, which I did for a time, and I still do occasionally, um, I started talking to a lot of different author coaches, and I came across Nick Thacker, and uh, you know, and he, you've been on his show actually. You were on his show before he and I connected, um, but in my conversation with him, we really hit it off, and uh, he was doing a self-publishing answers podcast, and. On a whim, one day I just asked him, "Hey, are you looking for a, a, a you know a, a second host? You know, have you ever considered that?" And he, you know, Nick's an amicable guy. He's like, "Sure, come on." You know, so he literally just in, on a whim added me to his show, and uh, <laughs> we did great. Now we've added uh, Justin Sloan, uh, who is the author of uh, Creative Writing Career, and then Justin. Um, Every time he gets an idea, he starts a podcast for it. So uh, he uh, created, he created, he has a couple of his own, but he created the Creative Writing Career Podcast. And that's me and Justin and uh, Stefan Bugai, who is um, formerly from uh, Pixar. Uh, and those two guys know each other from their, they write games for a living, uh, which is cool. And sort of the purpose behind all those, I mean, you know, self publishing answers is sort of in your, uh, vein. Uh, it's talking to that, the self-publishing industry and we're trying to answer the questions we have really uh, mm -hmm. when, it, when it comes down to it. We want to know we want to know things and so we talk about it, we investigate and we interview people. It's, it's an open format. Uh, creative Writing Career was um, really Justin's brainchild and it was more about, you know, there's more to creative writing as a career than just self-publishing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's game writing, there's films, there's, you know, TV, there's, you know, a, a crazy list of, of jobs you can get into, comic books, that sort of thing. So we wanted to create something that spoke to, uh, to that and opened up the, these channels to people uh, to discover new ways to make a living being creative. So mm -hmm. it's been a blast. Uh, that show actually by far has become much more popular, I believe, uh, than mm -hmm. the others. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't hurt my feelings at all. It might hurt Nick's feelings, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Nick's a good guy. He's he's pretty he's pretty laid back, so he'll be. Yeah. Just well, I think. Well, then I mean, I know a lot of people ask me because podcasting has just become so big in general. Uh -huh. um, how I mean, because that's a lot of time that you're spending yeah. podcasting. How does that fit into your business model? Um, sideways. Sideways, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> how would who would who would you recommend? Uh, start a podcast because it it does take so much. It does time. take time. Yeah. Um, if you well, the way it fits in my business model, uh, it's it's it, it helps with promoting my work. I, I do I like that aspect of it. Helps me build a following. I, I think that a lot of my readers are listeners and enjoy um, at least the Wordslinger podcast. A lot of my readers aren't all that interested in self publishing, so in that aspect, it didn't help um, boost my my book sales. Uh, but I, you know, I, I focus on story in the words Slinger podcast. It's, it's like a behind the scenes kind of look at everyone else's life. Um, so, you know, as, as it fits my business model, it's, um, it's really, it's a means of personal growth more than anything. Mm. I do get a small trickle of income from it. So it's, it is handy as an additional stream of income. Uh, but that's fairly rare. Um, in, in my <laughs> experience, you know, podcasts don't make money. Mm. Uh, very often. So in, unless that's really uh, a passion project for you, I'd recommend not starting a podcast and instead <laughs> uh, <laughs> concentrating on something else. However, 
Um, if you are, say, uh, someone like Justin Sloan, who uh, is very passionate about what he does and wants to share, uh, I would say the, the reason to get into it is not so much for you, but for the listener. Um, I continue to do these podcasts, even though at times I, I kind of wonder, like, what am I getting out of it? Because uh, I don't always get much out of it. Mm. <laughs> but uh, the, the fact is, I love the fact that I'm sharing um, these stories with people I interview, that I'm sharing information that I learn, uh, that I'm sharing the expertise of others. I, I love the fact that I'm helping a community larger than my immediate, you know, surroundings. I, I, I just, I do it. I, it so sounds so hammy. I do it for the listener. And if you're uh, interested in, in podcasting, that has to be at the heart of what you do. Because if you, you know, you're going to run out of steam if you're just, you know, I'm really interested in, you know, pick a topic. I'm really interested in RV life. So I'm going to do an RV podcast. Great. You know, and that's going to last you for a while. And you, it's an endless source of material. But how much energy do you want to put into it? And how passionate are you about it? Uh, your passion will run out. But if you're, if you're doing it because you, you want to keep feeding the needs of others, then that passion kind of renews itself. So that's what I'd recommend. <laughs> it's yeah. more abstract than practical, of course. So yeah, and I think it's funny the like you say. I mean, it, I've been. <laughs> I think I'm going into year six now. <laughs> yeah, you've been around for a while. <laughs> I know it's kind of crazy, <laughs> and yeah, it d definitely didn't make any money for oh five years. Um, right, so and right. that was never the aim. The aim was was not that. It was always to learn, as as you've said, right. and talk to people I want to talk to. So um, right. it was great to talk to you today. So where can people Thank find you, so you and your books and your shows online? You can find all of those uh, if you go to kevintumlinson.com, which I know is not the easiest thing in the world to spell, so I assume you'll have it in your show notes. But mm -hmm. if kevintumlinson.com, and of course I'm on Twitter and Facebook, and I always use Kevin Tumlinson as my username, so I'm easy to find. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Kevin. That was great. Thank you so much. I love talking to you.